Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the United States Chess Championship. It is round number six. We are at the halfway point of a 13-round tournament. And as always in today's recap, I am going to take you through all of the games, including a game where Hans Niemann went on a vicious attack. Now, let's be honest. We watch the U.S. Championship, yes, because there's a lot of very good players, but we're also watching and keenly observing the games of one Hans Niemann, the most popular chess player in the world right now. So where else... Can you go to find the world's most popular chess player getting discussed by the world's most popular chess channel? And you know who made the world's most popular chess channel? You. You're a part of this. Whenever people look at that subscriber number, what is that? That's you. That's every single one of you who are watching, supporting, whether it's at night, during the day, during a work break, during school, after school, before school, whatever it is. So thank you. Uh, I bet you didn't expect a wholesome introduction uh, to start off this video. Anyway, uh, it's 10 o'clock at night. I've had a very long day, including recording some over-the-board content in uh, the chess parks of New York City today with Danny Wrench uh, and Tani. Some of you may know uh, Tani uh, Adeumi. Uh, he's, uh, he's a young prodigy. I played him in an over-the-board tournament uh, not so long ago. So I'm very tired, but um, I watched, some, uh, watched the show with uh, wifey, had some dinner, and now here we are. First game I'm going to take you through is this game from the women's side of things. Uh, this is Irina Crush, uh, multiple-time uh, women's champion of the U.S., one of the most accomplished American female chess players ever. Um, so we have C4 from her, and she's going up against Talia Cervantes Landero. Uh, I think just she just goes by Talia Cervantes, but uh, when you have multiple last names, they do all get listed there. Like, I, I'm not hiding a last name from you. I'm not like Levy Rosman bleh or something. Uh, Black plays the move e5, and this is a very interesting line. So you'll notice that Black plays bishop b4, very provocative move, trying to get white to go knight d5, which is a line, uh, but white basically says, yeah, you can go ahead and capture this. And now Black does something I don't understand. Black doesn't capture, like, I played like this uh, in an over-the-board game, and my opponent just immediately took, because that's sort of the entire point. Like, if Black wanted to go knight f6, why did Black not play knight f6 here? I don't know. Maybe Black wanted to avoid knight f3. I'm really not sure. But Black does, in fact, take in a little bit. But first we get e4, right? So White plays this move e4, and then bc. Now, Black already here doesn't need to take on c3 anymore. Like, if Black wanted to take on c3, Black should have done that a while ago so that White would not be able to get this big center. Actually, the computer already does not like this concept. Uh, and now White just begins building up a very strong pawn center and a pawn flank. Black goes back to e6 with the idea, I guess, of playing like this and like this, or like this and like this, and then putting the queen on d7. But white is better here. White has definitely won the opening battle. Why? Because white has more central space, and white has the bishop pair, and I have something in my eyeball, which, like, is really annoying, because dealing with it in the, minute, in the middle of a YouTube video really just shouldn't happen. And I don't want to edit here, because that would mean I have to delay my publishing by another 30 minutes, and I really want to go to sleep. Anyway, okay, I think I fixed it. A4, A5. So white has an advantage, right? And white begins here firing with the move C5. It's a very interesting move, very provocative move. The point is you are trying to get black to take so you can grab a center pawn and just have an overwhelming amount of center space. Black should not take. Black should not play C5. Uh, black should not play DC5. What black should play here is a move like knight A6 or knight D7 hitting this pawn and forcing white into this capture, uh, which would improve black's position. Uh, black could even consider uh, maybe queen d6, but uh, then you would need to deal with bishop a3 and things of that nature. This move is completely reasonable. But instead of that, uh, Talia just doesn't seem convinced by Irina's pawn sacrifice idea, which really, it's not a pawn sacrifice, it's a pawn trade, but she also improves her structure. And now white is going to go here, here, and here, and here. And it's not really clear to me what black is going to do. Black offers a trade. Here comes f4 immediately. Okay. Now, white could have, by the way, gone back and just done this. Like, just push, try to, like, expand like this. White does this. And now you see black trying to win this pawn. Now bishop f4. Bishop f4 is a very, very prov uh, provocative move. The idea of bishop f4, look, there's g5 here. Right? You know what uh, I think Irina would have played if this happened? Bishop c1. Now, she might have gone bishop e3, but the point is that after bishop to c1 and knight takes e5, white plays d4, let's say cd4, cd4, where's the knight gonna go? This is the only move. 
Because anything else, there was d5. Now d5 anyway. Bishop d7 back, queen d4, bishop b2, checkmate. So, in a shocking way, bishop f4 provoking this move and literally retreating shows that sometimes baiting pawn moves out of your opponents is very, very, very good for you. Especially when those pawns uh, hold together the defense of the enemy king. Pawns can't go to their home square. The bishop literally went out for a walk, got slapped across the face, and just retreated back home, okay? But you can't take this back, right? So Talia doesn't do that. She plays rook e8, but now here comes the attack. Here comes g4. The bishop slides back, and now here comes g5, okay? And now Irina plays d4. So Irina's just throwing everything forward, all her forces. Take, take, moves the rook out of danger, trying to win back this pawn. Black plays knight h7. We have d5, locking the door on the light squared bishop. All right, you didn't come home in time? All right, you're locked out now. No, parents don't do that to your children. That's really messed up. Queen e7, unless they're like adults and kind of like deadbeat. But even then, give them a chance. Listen, life is long. You know what I'm saying? You can always turn it around. I don't know where this became a philosophical video, but bishop d4, queen c2, rook c1. Look at, look at, white, look at this blob. I mean, look at Irina's center. I mean, that is a center to behold. And the best part is that you could treat that center like, you know, it's in a museum. You could just be like, wow. Because black can't do anything. If black plays f6, white's just going to go e6. Or even take, by the way. Uh, and if black plays c6, that hangs a pawn in, a in three different ways. So that's just not a good one. Four different ways. Um, hangs another pawn. Um, so, and there's pawn push. So black plays c5. Now, Irina here is a very good player. Okay? She's a grandmaster level player. Obviously, as you can see. But you see, Irina's not well-versed in chess memes. She doesn't know that en passant is actually forced. Uh, it doesn't matter even if it loses you the game. She, she's got to get with her chess memes, but, you know, she's trying to win the game, so she plays bishop c3, uh, retreats, and goes like this. And, yeah, I mean, her attack is just unstoppable. She bulldozes the king's position. Yes, black is able to get all of this. White's best assets in this position are these pawns. And these pawns are not going to stop, all right? She very slowly removes the defense of, the, of g5, and um, the bishops are too strong, the queen is too strong, and two rooks are equal to a queen in many cases, not in this case. Just don't hang your queen, please. King h1, very nice move. <laughs> King h2 just avoids some more problems, and uh, Irina wins this game by just crashing through, and now checkmate is completely unstoppable, and it actually is allowed to happen on the board. So, very nice win from uh, Irina, who now after six rounds, I believe is tied for first in the U.S. Uh, Women's Championship. So she's looking to get yet another title to her resume. Now, I have a few games for you uh, from the open side. We have Elshan Muradiabadi versus Fabiano Caruana. Fabi goes back to his roots, man. Like, Fabi back in the day, and a lot of top guys back in the day, used to play the Taiman of Sicilian. It's one of the most interesting openings, uh, and it, the, the, it has been replaced, really, by the Nidorf, which is, like, what all the elitists play. You know, it's like... I'm not very, I don't know a whole lot about other industries, but like, I think it's like probably in fashion. Like some things are just trendy for a while. There's nothing wrong with what used to exist, but, and now it's just trendy. And what you need is you need like a top fashion designer. You need like a top chess player to just briefly like go back to playing something that, you know, once was popular. And uh, yeah, we see Fabi doing that here. He goes back for a legendary variation. He doesn't play the Taimanov with queen c7. He also doesn't play the four knights Taimanov with knight f6, but rather he plays a6. Very, very sharp line. Now here, white has a lot of setups, but the sharpest setup for sure is bishop e3. Uh, and then after a move like uh, knight f6, uh, white oftentimes will even play queen f3. Like I've, queen f3 has become very popular. Uh, this sort of setup. Now, I don't exactly remember if that's against queen c7 or with knight f6. Uh, I am not a theoretician on the Taimanov, but white also plays queen d2, f3, long castle. Just very aggressive type of stuff here as well. But bishop f4. Bishop f4 is a very interesting move. You will remember I played bishop f4 myself after it was played in the candidates between Rapport and Duda. Do you remember that? No? I played this against Tani, who I mentioned in my intro. And it's it gets played in this game too. And... What white does throughout uh, this, the opening now is try to apply pressure to this pawn. So maybe take, maybe queen d2, maybe bishop b2. We're, we're, we're about to find out. There's bishop b2, bishop d7. And Fabi is playing this like a classical Sicilian with the bishops here and then the knights. And then here Fabi plays e5, completely giving up the d5 square to white. And Elshan here plays bishop g4. 
So the point of bishop g4, it's a very interesting idea. The point of bishop g4 is to get the queen out, and if black, like, for example, plays something passive, uh, white can already begin various attacks, but also just this and knight d5 is very, very pleasant for white. Bishop g4 is a very nice move, trying to remove the light squared bishop so that knight d5 becomes a possibility. And just so you understand what this might look like in the long run, just hypothetically speaking, in the long run, when you completely dominate that d5 square, you're just going to have a permanent advantage, right? So Fabi, understanding that, starts getting wild and wacky h5. So you can't take this because you're going to get your queen trapped. So queen back to h3, and now h4. The bishop's not trapped, though, because it can't actually be taken. f3, and the bishop gets out. But look at, what, look, look at this. Fabi, children are going to watch this recap, you know? And I'm supposed to be an educator and an entertainer of both adults and kids alike. What am I supposed to tell those kids when you've moved your damn pawn to h4, you move your rook to h6? Fabi, you playing this like a 600. And the best part is, he's playing the top engine moves, all right? Like, literally, this is the way you're supposed to... So Fabiano, now, on a serious note, joking aside, Fabiano is playing in this game the way you're supposed to play when you are strategically in trouble. You will notice that everything I described, right, the bad square, the backwards pawn here, right? Fabi is offsetting that with dynamic play because that is the way you equalize things uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a chess kind of d imbalanced sort of way. So when you're worse from, like, a... A visual standpoint, you you have to now create dynamic play in the position, and you'll notice that black just doesn't castle. He just walks his king to over to f8. Then Fabi's like, well, I've restored some stability, so time to instigate. Knight a5. Knight, I haven't pulled my microphone cord out, right? No, I didn't. Okay, cool. Knight a5. Some of you probably wish that. No, you don't. You're 11 minutes into my video. If you're 11 minutes into a video and you hate it, that's a you problem. It's not a me problem anymore. Knight d3, knight c4, knight b4. You'll notice Elshan is basically like, yeah, I, you could take this. I'm going for d5. Fabi actually doesn't like that. He goes for a queen trade. And I don't really know what Elshan is doing over here. I think Elshan just really likes horses. But you'll notice that he hasn't moved like at all anywhere over here. Kind of goes to show you how powerful Fabiano's play. And now the knight goes all the way back. And now Fabi just jumps in. All right, so it's a fork. And if Elshan takes... Then after here and king h1, he actually loses by force. Like, you think you're safe? Knight h5, and there's no way to stop this. So, like, knight, like, this is mate. I mean, imagine getting ravaged like this. This is crazy. So suddenly, Alshan's like, wait a minute, I'm like, I'm actually, like, totally screwed here. Knight e3, he has to sacrifice a rook, and the attack is anything but over. Fabi continue. king g8, look at that. What a disrespectful move. You know what the idea of king g8 is, by the way? The idea of king g8 is that in the future you might play rook h8, king h7, and get the rook out. You can also, of course, just do this. Yeah, Fabi just kind of pass back move. Rook g6. Okay, he loses a pawn on the queen side, but he activates the bishop a bit more directly in the middle. And what's the only piece in the black position that hasn't moved that can? The b pawn. And that's the final domino that's going to fall. Elshan begins trying to trade and gets his pieces a little bit more active. There's like a triple fork here. Rook c2, and I mean, these knights just aren't, they're not participating. You can sacrifice the exchange, but white is completely dominated on the second rank and the first rank as well. And uh, it's just a matter of technique now. As Fabi begins the cleanup process, the king is safe on the outskirts of the board. And uh, yeah, you could check it a few times, but that's the end of the game. As Fabi is about to pick up two more pawns. Fabiano played a beautiful game. Like this was the level difference between a very strong grandmaster, and a former world championship contender. I mean, Fabi just showed up, played a Taimanov, they got a mildly imbalanced game, and Alshan really tried to impose a game plan early, and Fabi was just bulletproof. I mean, every move he played, top engine move, top engine move, or I think knight f6 was like top, whatever, but we're just gonna pipe it up. All right, knight f6, rook d1, this, the whole approach of the, the, the best move in this position is literally king f8. And then this entire idea, knight a5, knight c4, all like Fabi just played a breathtaking game. Literally just a perfect game. Okay. What can you say? What can you say? Uh, great game from Fabiano. And um, the next one that I have for you is this very long game. 70 move long end game between Levon Aronian and Dario Schwierz. 
Uh, first of all, if your name ends with Z's, your first and last name, that's like boss behavior right there. That's the, that's 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 how you know you're you're talking to someone from Poland. Um, now this one was a semi slav. Aronian did not play d4, so he goes for this kind of English setup where you do not play the move d4 ever. Like literally, you'll notice that White just has not. In fact, he's he's doing it so deliberately. He's even putting the bishop in front of his own pawn. Now, sometimes what happens here, you may remember the game from the first round, Eswaran versus uh, uh, Alice Lee. And in that game, White played like Rook G1 and then G4, G5. White just went on a total attacking Bonanza. This move order for Black does not allow that for White. So instead, White does it this way. H4 now. You see Levon still trying to instigate. Like, look at this. I mean, Levon, what are you doing? I mean, Levon, it's like you're playing a Blitz game against me in Title Tuesday. Knight FG5 now. Just so you're aware, you cannot take this, as you can see from the bar. Uh, that's called a fishing pole, all right? You just bait all of this and you just win. Having said that, you can't take it, but what exactly is the threat? Well, Levon goes queen f3, walking into a pin because now the threat is knight f6 and queen here. So what does black do? Begin trading. Black is under attack, so he trades everything, literally everything, and goes up a pawn. Levon plays rook to h3, another rook lift, playing like Fabi, rook g3. Guys, kids watch these recaps, all right? I get criticized for cursing during my recaps every now and then or during my Twitch streams. What is this? I mean, this is worse than cursing, okay? All of this, you are a bad chess influence. Kids are watching like, oh, I'm never gonna castle, I'm just gonna go pff, 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 pff. I'm gonna play like shoots and ladders. I'm gonna play snake with, my, I'm gonna play Monopoly. With my rooks, I'm not going to castle my king, queen h5, and now queen h1 is on the way. Oh, white's queen begins infiltrating. Look at this. Rook d8, Levon picks up a pawn. Knight f6, and Levon picks up another pawn. Okay, now we have check. Are we going to get a draw? Is this going to be a draw? King e2, wait a minute. What is Levon blo- Oh. Okay, but Levon obviously didn't blunder that. Knight f4! Oh my. Levon was completely equal here. And in this position, the move rook c4 just lost the game on the spot. Levon's idea of rook c4 was this. He, wa he wanted to continue attacking, but I'm just like shocked he just didn't go here. And I mean, the fact that he allowed this was crazy already. But now queen d3 check, king f3 check, rook e4, and f5. And Darius is literally mating Levon. I mean, he's just mating him. Only move bishop c3. Queen e4, king e2, the attack rages on. Check. Check. All right, he's going to repeat once. Now, the best move here is to continue firing away. You have to go g5 because you are threatening to trap the rook. Now, there is queen a7, okay? There is rook d7 attacking the queen. And then there is g4. And black cannot stop these... Uh, bl white cannot stop this attack. There's, like, ways to try to get out of this... White has a bunch of extra pawns, but uh, yeah, that doesn't happen. Darius gives White a second chance at life here by playing a couple of slow moves. And now, after 40 moves aside, we have an endgame. And I have an itchy nose. It is an extra pawn for White, bishop for a rook. Okay, so Black is still winning. How is he going to do it? Black has a very good structure, very good activity. All right, now he's won a pawn. Now he's creating mate threats. That was literally made in one. The best move here apparently was bishop d2, which is very tough to understand. But basically, you want to put the rook behind the pawns. Okay? Instead of that, white just begins losing the house, and it turns into a crazy pawn race, like a completely insane pawn race. Look at this. Rook is hanging. Okay, but... If you take on g2, this rook is also hanging. But then there's rook h6, king h6, bishop d2 check. And you queen and run away from back rank. But instead of that, Schwierz plays it safe with rook c8, d6, and does it this way. Now this is pinning the rook to the king, and this is a queen. But this is also a queen. What is happening? If I put you in this position, you may lose. If I put me in this position, I may lose. But there's one final thing here and that's the h pawn and it goes and when white tries to defend the black rook i don't know why schwierz didn't just finish off the plan but first he comes back 
Then he starts bringing his king. I'm not exactly, like, I'm not sure Schwierz fully remembered that if he promotes, he makes a queen. I'm joking, but, uh, yeah, seriously. Pu pu push your pawns! Bro, h3, please? Like, he was attacking it, Darius, what? Why not? Okay, king f5, fine. All right, king, yes. He really wanted to stop the pawns. All right, he did not want to throw the game away. Now there are no pawns, and the bishop is lost, and that is how he's going to win it. Yes, all of this happens, but the black king and the black rook are just simply too strong. And uh, the only thing you have to do here is not stalemate, which is possible. I mean, it is possible to stalemate, uh, but that's it. Rook d1 is on the way, and uh, Levon has now lost two games in a row. Levon just lost to a wonder. Levon has lost to um, Schwierz, which is, uh, which is wild. And Schwierz gets a huge win over Levon now. This is, of course, our main event of the evening. This is the Hans Niemann belligerent attacking game versus uh, Ray Rops. Now, Hans plays a move order that's super rare, right? We just saw Bishop F4 in a Taimanov. To not develop a knight on the third move or to not play the Catalan or the Nimso and to play a bishop move, like, it, you'd think that, like, this is like, oh, what's the big deal? No, it's like a pretty serious deal, especially this line. CD5, Knight D5, volunteering himself for a retreat. What? Well, it turns out Magnus has played this kind of hilarious Hans using a line that Magnus played earlier, uh, like, last year, or maybe this year. I think it was last year against Wesley So. Um... And notice that black is not taking like this. Black actually wants to punish the fact that white has a bishop there. So a super imbalanced line from the early opening. And straight up a pawn sacrifice by white, by the way. And Ray just doesn't take it. Like, what a... What a, what a guy. You know, the guy's offering him just a free pawn two different ways. And Ray's like, I'm not interested in your prep. Take, take. E5, knight, D5. Black castles. Now Hans kicks out the bishop. The bishop refuses to leave. Or Ray Robson is the most stubborn guy... Stubborn guy ever. Look at this. He kicks out the bishop once again. The bishop refuses to leave. He's like, yeah, take it. Because after take and you play rook c5, I have queen b6, for example. I have bishop b7, rook b8. Like, I'm not afraid. I mean, Ray Robson is just stubborn. He's just not leaving. He's like, oh, you want to develop your bishop, Hans? No, let's trade bishops, Hans. Okay, castles. Now, here Ray plays one of the most absurd moves I've ever seen. Queen a8. Queen a8 has a hilarious idea. The idea of queen to a8 is to threaten this knight via knight e3, which would fork these two pieces and then ultimately let white uh, structure get damaged. So obviously, Hans sees that. Knight f5, knight h4, take, take, and Hans plays queen h5, right? This is the beginning of the Hans Neiman attack. All right, he's looking to get f4, rook f1, rook e1, and so on. Ray looks at it and goes, I know the best way to address this attack. B5. See, if you did not understand the demands of a position and pushed the pawn on the other side of the board that seemingly did nothing, I would yell at you. But it's Ray Robson, right? So what is Ray trying to do? Bring his rook into the game? And Ray is like, well, if I trade Hans pieces before he has a chance to attack me, he's not going to have pieces to attack me with, right? So Hans could play knight d4, Hans could try to play, you know, for mate, but there is no mate. That's what Ray is basically saying. Hans doesn't think so and plays rook d1. Ray here does something so cold-blooded, it follows the philosophy and the motto of the whole game. He's like, ah, I see. Hans is trying to keep pieces on the board so he can attack me with f4, f5, knight d4, and so on. Okay, that's interesting. Now, what is the best way to deal with an incoming attack? I want to go eat a pawn. It's like when the apocalypse is coming and you just want to go have an ice cream cone. Ray just wants to win a pawn because then maybe he will win a second pawn too. I mean, Ray is basically saying, Hans, your attack is bogus. All right, Hans says you can't have my pawn. Ray says, no, I really want the pawn. Hans is like, all right, Ray, knight d4. Go take the pawn on a3. Hans could take on b5, but of course that's not the attack. And then this would happen, right? So if we go back for a moment, Hans got everything set up to begin firing away. f4. What does Ray do in the face of danger on the king side? Moves his rook yet again. Look at Black's last few moves. Rook c2, rook a2, rook a3, rook a2. <laughs> like he just doesn't get... 
because he understands that in the future, the counterplay is going to speak for itself. F5. Hans is a move away from delivering a fatal blow. And now, Ray pokes a hole in the parachute. Knight c3. Uh-oh. Now this is under attack, and this is under attack. And if you take, we see the queen on a8. I mean, queen a8 was some sort of, like, wicked genius move from a long time ago. Hans doesn't care and plays f6. Now queen g5 is going to be made. Knight g5 is going to be made. Taking here is going to be a problem. The only move, the only move here, not take the knight, not take this. Sack the bishop. Why? Because when this happens, I take your knight. And when this happens, I move my rook. And the king has an umbrella pawn. Whereas, if you had done it this way, then I wouldn't have taken here. I would have gone this way, which would have been a problem. So he volunteers his bishop as a tribute. Knight takes f6, check gf6, but mate is threatened. And because it's threatened, Hans does not get to play anything here to improve his attack. He must go back, sacrifice more material, and it's made in two. But Ray sidesteps. Now Ray says, Do you feel in charge? Like Bane from Dark Knight. Rook g8. And I think he is asking us, Who is attacking who? Here comes the queen. Down to e2. Hans plays some defense. But the knight is lost because you are pinned to the king. And one move away from checkmate, rook takes g2. White now has to take and blunder a fork. Not blunder, allow a fork. If white doesn't take, white gets mated. And a move away from victory and glory with a savage attacking game. Unfortunately, Hans Niemann had to resign. And Ray Robson was the winner of this game. A very exciting game, very exciting recap. I hope you enjoyed it. I recorded this late in the evening, uh, but I think I had pretty good energy today. And I will see you all tomorrow for more chess content, more content from the US Championships. Let me know if you en have enjoyed the two games, uh, the two videos a day schedule. I've enjoyed it very much, and I will continue to do so while I have the energy. See ya! Get out of here.